Stanford University. Okay, let's get started. Okay, so today we're going to get into some of the details about how, how we train neural networks. So some administrative details first. Uh, assignment one is due today, uh, Thursday, so 11.59 p.m. tonight on Canvas. We're also going to be releasing assignment two today. And then your project proposals are due Tuesday, April 25th. So you should be really starting to think about your, your projects now if you haven't already. Uh, how many people have to have decided what they want to do for their project so far? OK. So some, some people. So uh, yeah, everyone else, um, the, you can go to TA office hours if you, if you want uh, suggestions and, and um, bounce ideas off of, off of TAs. Uh, we also have a list of, of projects that other people have proposed, uh, some people usually affiliated with Stanford, so on Piazza. So you can take a look at those. Um, for additional ideas. And we also have uh, some notes on backprop for linear layer and uh, vector and tensor derivatives that Justin's written up. Uh, so this should help with understanding how exactly backprop works and for vectors and, and matrices. So these are linked to lecture four on the syllabus, and you can go and uh, take a look at those. Okay, so where we are now, uh, we've talked about how to express a function in terms of an, a computational graph, right? We can, we can represent any function in terms of a computational graph. And we've talked more explicitly about uh, neural networks, uh, which is a type of graph where we have these linear layers that we stack on top of each other with uh, nonlinearities in between. And we've also talked last lecture about convolutional neural networks. Uh, which are a particular type of network that uh, uses convolution layers to preserve the spatial structure throughout all the, the uh, hierarchy of the network. And so we saw exactly how a convolution layer looked, where each activation map in the convolution layer output is produced by sliding a filter of weights over all of the spatial locations in the, in the input. And we also saw that usually we can have many filters per layer. Uh, each of which produces a separate activation map. Uh, and so what we can get is from an input right, with a certain depth, we'll get an uh, activation map output, which is, um, has some spatial dimension that's preserved, as well as the depth is the total number of filters that we have in that layer. And so what we want to do is we want to learn the values of all of these weights or parameters. And we saw that we can learn our network parameters uh, through optimization, which, which we talked about a little bit earlier in the course. Right? And so we want to get to a point in the loss landscape that produces a low loss. And we can do this by taking steps in the direction of the negative gradient. And so the whole process we actually call a mini batch stochastic gradient descent, where the steps are that we continuously we sample a batch of data. We forward prop it through our computational graph or our, or our neural network. We get the loss at the end. We back prop through our network to calculate the gradients. And then we update the parameters uh, or the weights in our network using this gradient. OK, so now for uh, the next couple of lectures, we're going to talk about some of the details involved in training neural networks. And so this involves things like, how do we set up our neural network at the beginning? Uh, which activation functions that we choose, how do we pre-process the data, weight initialization, regularization, gradient checking. Uh, we'll also talk, talk about training dynamics. So how do we babysit the learning process? Uh, how do we do, choose how we do parameter <coughs> updates, specific parameter update rules? And how do we do hyperparameter optimization to choose the best hyperparameters? And then we'll also talk about uh, evaluation and uh, model ensembles. So today in the first part, uh, we'll talk about activation functions, data preprocessing, weight initialization, batch normalization, babysitting the learning process, and hyperparameter optimization. OK, so, so first, activation functions. So we saw earlier how at a, any particular layer, we have the data coming in. We multiply by our weights in you know, fully connected or a convolutional layer. And then we'll pass this through an activation function or nonlinearity. 
And we saw some examples of this. Uh, we used sigmoid previously in some of our examples. We also saw the ReLU nonlinearity. And so today we'll talk more about different choices for these different nonlinearities and trade-offs between them. So first, the sigmoid, which we've seen before and probably the one we're most comfortable with. Right, so the sigmoid function is, uh, as we have up here, 1 over 1 plus e to the negative x. And what this does is it takes each number that's input into the uh, sigmoid nonlinearity, so each element, and it element-wise squashes these uh, into this range 0, 1, right, Look, using this function here. And so if you get very high values uh, as input, then the output is going to be something near 1. If you get very low values, or sorry, very negative values, it's going to be near 0. And then we have this regime near 0 that it's, it's in a linear regime. It looks a bit like a linear function. And so this has been historically popular uh, because sigmoids, in a sense, you can interpret them uh, as a kind of a saturating firing rate of a neuron, right? So it's something between 0 and 1. You could think of it as a firing rate. And we'll, we'll talk later about uh, other nonlinearities like ReLU's that in, in practice uh, actually turn out to be more biologically pl plausible. But this does have a kind of interpretation that you could make. So if we look at this nonlinearity more carefully, there's several problems that there actually are with this. So the first is that saturated neurons can kill off the gradient. And so what exactly does this mean? So if we look at a sigmoid gate, right, a node in our computational graph, and we have our data x that's input into it, and then we have the output of the sigmoid gate coming out of it, what does the, what does the gradient flow look like as we're coming back? We have dl over d sigma, right, the, the upstream gradient coming down, and then we're going to multiply this by uh, d, sigma, d sigma over dx. This will be the gradient of the local sigmoid function, and we're going to chain these together for our uh, downstream gradient that we pass back. So who can tell me what happens when x is equal to negative 10? It's very negative. What does this gradient look like? Zero. Yeah, so uh, that's right. So the, the gradient becomes zero, and that's because in this negative, very negative region of the sigmoid, the, it's essentially flat, so the gradient is zero, and we chain any upstream gradient coming down, we multiply by basically something near zero, and we're going to get a very small gradient that's flowing back downwards, right? So in a sense, after the chain rule, uh, this, this kills the gradient flow, and you're gonna have a zero gradient passed down to, um, to uh, downstream nodes. And so what happens when x is equal to zero? I think it's, yeah, it's, it's fine in, in this regime, right? So in this regime near zero, uh, you're going to get a reasonable gradient here, and then it'll be fine for backprop. And then uh, what about x equals 10? Zero, right. So again, so when uh, x is equal to very negative or x is equal to uh, large positive numbers, then these are all regions where the sigmoid function is flat, and it's going to kill off the gradient, and you're not going to get a gradient flow coming back. Okay, so a second problem is that the sigmoid outputs are not zero-centered. Um, and so let's take a look at why this is a problem. So consider what happens when the input to a neuron is always positive. So in this case, all of our x's we're going to say is positive. It's going to be multiplied by some weight w, and then, um, and then we're going to uh, run it through our activation function. So what can we say about the gradients on W? So, so think about um, what the local gradient is going to be, right, for this linear layer. Um, we have, we have uh, DL over whatever the, the activation function, the loss coming down. And then we have our local gradient, uh, which is going to be basically X, right? And so, so what does this mean if all of X is, is positive? Okay, so I heard it's always going to be positive. Uh, so that's almost right. It's, it's always going to be either positive or all positive or all negative, right? So our upstream gradient coming down is um, dl over our loss L. It's going to be dl over df. And this is going to be either positive or negative. It's some arbitrary gradient coming down. And then our local gradient that we multiply this by is uh, if we're going to find the gradients on W is going to be right, df over dw, 
which is going to be x, right? And so if x is always positive, then the gradients on w, which is multiplying these two together, are going to always uh, be um, the sign of the upstream gradient coming down. And so what this means is that all the gradients of w, since they're always either positive or negative, they're always going to move in the same direction. Right, you're either going to increase all of the, uh, when you do a parameter update, you're going to either increase all of the values of W by a positive amount or differing, differing positive amounts, or you will decrease them all. Um, and so the problem with this is that this gives very inefficient gradient updates. Right? So if you look at, uh, on the right here, we have an example of a case where, let's say W is two-dimensional. Right, so we have um, our two axes for W. And if we say that we can only have all positive or all negative updates, then we have these two quadrants, right, and are, are the two places where the axes are either all positive or all, all negative. And these are the only directions in which we're allowed to make a gradient update. And so in the case where, let's say, our, hypothet our hypothetical optimal W is actually this blue vector here, Right, and we're starting off at you know, some point, right, at the top of the, the, the beginning of the red arrows. We can't just directly take a gradient update in this direction because this is, a, this is not in one of those two allowed gradient directions. And so what we're going to have to do is we'll have to take a sequence of gradient updates, uh, for example, in these uh, red arrow directions that are each in allowed directions in order to uh, finally get to this optimal W. Um, and so, so this is why also, in general, we, we want a zero mean data, right? So we want our input x to be zero mean so that we actually have um, positive and negative values and we don't get into this problem of uh, the gradient, gradient updates w all moving in the same direction. Um, so is this, is this clear? Any questions on this point? OK. OK, so we've talked about these two uh, main problems of a sigmoid. right? The saturated neurons can kill the gradients if we're too positive or too negative of an input. Um, they're also not zero-centered, and so we get these, uh, this inefficient kind of gradient update. And then a third problem, um, we have an exponential function in here, so this is a little bit computationally expensive. In the grand scheme of your network, this is usually not the main problem because we have all of these convolutions and dot products that are a lot more expensive. But this is just a minor uh, point also to observe. So now we can look at a second activation function uh, here at tan h. And so this looks very similar to the sigmoid. But the difference is that now it's squashing to the range negative 1 and 1. So here, the main difference is that um, it's, it's now zero-centered. So we've gotten rid of the second problem that we had. Uh, it still kills the gradients, however, uh, when it's saturated. right? So you still have these uh, regimes where the, where the gradient is essentially flat, and um, you're going to kill the gradient flow. So this is, this is a bit better than the sigmoid, but it still has some problems. OK, so now let's look at the ReLU activation function. And this is one that we saw uh, in our examples last lecture when we, talk, when we were talking about the convolutional neural network. And we saw that we interspersed ReLU nonlinearities between many of the convolutional layers. Right? And so this function is f of x equals max of 0 and x. So it takes an element-wise uh, operation on your input. And basically, if your input is negative, it's going to put it to 0. And then if it's uh, positive, it's going to be just passed through. It's the identity. Um, and so, so this is one that's pretty commonly used. And if we look at this one and look at the think about the problems that we saw earlier with the sigmoid and the tan h, we can see that it doesn't saturate uh, in, the, in the positive region. So there's this whole half of our input space where um, it's, it's not going to saturate. So this is a big advantage. So this is also computationally very efficient. Right? We saw earlier that the sigmoid and the, uh, has this e uh, exponential in it. And so the ReLU um, is just this simple max, and there's, it's extremely fast. Um, and in practice, using this ReLU, it converges much faster uh, than the sigmoid and the tanh, so about six times faster. Um, 
And it's also turned out to be more biologically plausible than the sigmoid. So if you look at a neuron and you look at what the inputs look like and you look, like, look at what the outputs look like and you try and measure this uh, in you know, neuroscience experiments, you'll see that this one is actually a, a closer uh, approximation to what's happening than sigmoids. And so ReLUs uh, were started to be used a lot around 2012 when we had AlexNet, the first major convolutional neural network that was able to do well on ImageNet and, and large-scale data. Uh, they used the ReLU in their uh, experiments. So a problem, however, with the ReLU is that it's still, it's not, not zero-centered anymore. So we saw that the sigmoid was not zero-centered, 10H fixed this, and now ReLU has this problem again, right? And so that's, that's one of the issues of the ReLU. Um, and then we also have this further annoyance of, again, we saw that uh, in the positive half of the inputs, we don't have saturation, but this is not the case in the negative half. Right, so just thinking about this a little bit more precisely, so what's happening here when x equals negative 10? <laughs> So zero gradient, that's right. Um, what happens when x is equal to positive 10? It's good, right? So we're in the linear uh, regime. And then um, what happens when x equals, is equal to zero? Yeah, so it's, uh, it's undefined here, but in practice we'll say you know, um, zero, right? And so uh, basically it's killing the gradient in half of the regime. And so we can this get this phenomenon of uh, basically dead ReLUs, right, when we're in this bad part of the, of the regime. And so there's, you can look at this in, uh, com as coming from several potential reasons. And so if we look at our data cloud here, right, this is all of our, our uh, training data, um, then if we look at where the ReLUs can fall, so the ReLUs can be, uh, each of these is basically right, the, the half of the plane where it's going to activate, right? And so each of these is the plane that defines each of, the, each of these ReLUs. And we can see that you can have these dead ReLUs that are basically off of the data cloud, and in, the, in this case it will uh, never activate and, and never update as compared to an active ReLU where some of the data is going to be uh, positive and pass through and, and some won't be. And so there are several reasons for this. The first is, is that it can happen when you have bad initialization. Right, so if you have weights that happen to be unlucky and they happen to be off the data cloud, so they happen to specify this bad ReLU over here, then they're never going to get a, a data input that causes it to activate. And so they're, they're never going to get um, a good gradient flow coming back, and so it'll just never update and never activate. Um, what's a more common case is when your learning rate is too high. And so in this case, you started off with an OK ReLU, but because you're making these huge updates, the, the, the weights jump around, and then your ReLU unit, in a sense, gets knocked off of the data manifold, right? And so, so this happens through training. So it was fine at the beginning, and then at some point it became bad, and, and it uh, died. And so if, in practice, if you freeze a network that you've trained and you pass the data through, you can see that actually as much as uh, 10 to 20 percent of the network is these dead ReLUs. And so, um, you know, that's, that's a problem, but and also most networks do have this type of problem when you use ReLU, some of them will be dead, and uh, in practice, you know, people look into this, uh, in, it's a research problem, but it's, it's still doing okay for training networks. Yeah, is that a question? Right. Uh, so the question is, yeah, so the data cloud is just your training data. Um, okay, so the question is, when, how do you tell when the ReLU is going to be dead or not uh, with respect to the data cloud? And so if you look at, uh, this is an example of like a simple two-dimensional case, right? And so our, our ReLU, we're going to get our input to the ReLU, which is going to be uh, basically, uh, you know, W1, X1 plus W2, X2, and then we apply this. Uh, so that, that defines this, this separating hyperplane here, and then we're going to take half of it that's going to be positive, and half of it's going to be uh, killed off. And so, um, yeah, so you, you know, you just, 
it's whatever the weights happen to be and where the data happens to be is where these, uh, where these hyperplanes fall. Um, and so, so, yeah, so it's just throughout the course of training, some of your ReLUs will uh, be in different places with respect to the data cloud. Uh, oh, question. So, okay, so the question is, for the sigmoid, we talked about two drawbacks, and one of them was that the uh, neurons can get saturated. So let's go back to the sigmoid here. And the question was, this is not the case when all of your inputs are positive. So when, when all of your inputs are positive, they're all going to be coming in right in this zero plus region here. And so you, you can still get a saturating neuron uh, because the, you see uh, up in this positive regime, it also plateaus at one. And so when, it's, when you have large positive values as input, you're also going to get the zero gradient because you have a, you have a flat slope here. Okay. Okay, so in practice, uh, people also like to initialize ReLUs with slightly positive biases in order to increase the likelihood of it being active at initialization and to get some updates, right? And so um, this basically just biases towards more ReLUs firing at the beginning. And in practice, some say that it helps, some say that it doesn't. Um, generally, uh, people don't always use this. It's, yeah, a lot of times people just uh, initialize it with zero biases still. Okay, so now we can look at some modifications on the ReLU that have uh, come out since then. And so one example is this leaky ReLU. And so this looks very similar to the original ReLU and the only difference is that now instead of being flat in the negative regime, we're going to give a, a slight negative slope here. And so this, this solves a lot of the uh, problems that we mentioned earlier. Right here we don't have a saturating, any saturating regime even in the negative. Uh, negative space, it's still very computationally efficient. It still converges faster than sigmoid and 10H, so it's very similar to a ReLU, um, and it doesn't have this dying problem. And there's also uh, another, another example is the parametric uh, rectifier, so P ReLU. And so in this case, it's just like the leaky ReLU where we again have this, this sloped region in the negative space, but now the slope in the negative regime is uh, determined through this alpha parameter. So we don't specify it, we don't hard code it, but we treat it as now a parameter that we can backprop into and learn. And so this gives it a little bit more flexibility. And we also have something called an exponential linear unit, an ELU. So we have all of these different types of, you know, LUs basically. Um, and this one, again, you know, it has all of the benefits of the ReLU, but, uh, but now, your, it's, it also is closer to zero mean outputs, right? So that's actually an advantage that um, the leaky ReLU, parametric ReLU, a lot of these, they allow you to have uh, your mean closer to zero. Um, but compared with the leaky ReLU, instead of it being uh, sloped in the negative regime, here you actually are building back in a negative saturation regime. And uh, there's arguments that basically this allows you to have some more robustness to noise um, and, and you basically get these deactivation states that can be more uh, robust. And uh, you can uh, look at this paper for, there's a lot of kind of more justification for all of why this is the case. Um, and in a sense, this is kind of something in between the ReLUs and the leaky ReLUs, right? Where it has some of this shape, uh, which the, re the leaky ReLU does, which gives it closer to zero mean outputs, but then it also still has some of this more saturating behavior that ReLUs have. A question. So whether this uh, parameter alpha is going to be specific for each uh, neuron. So I believe it is often specified, but I actually can't remember exactly. So if you can uh, look in the paper for exactly yeah, how this is, this is defined. Um, but um, yeah, so I, I believe it's, this function is basically very carefully designed in order to have um, nice, desirable properties. Um, okay, so there's basically all of these kinds of variants on the ReLU, right? And so you can see that, you know, all of these, it's kind of, uh, 
you can argue that each one may have certain benefits, certain drawbacks. Um, in practice, people just want to run experiments on all of them and see empirically what works better, try and justify it, and, and come up with new ones. Um, but they're all different things that are being experimented with. And so uh, let's just um, mention one, one more. Uh, this is the max out neuron. And so this one looks a little bit different in that it doesn't have the same form as the others did of taking your basic you know, dot product and then putting this element-wise nonlinearity in front of it. Um, instead, it looks like this, this max of uh, w dot product with x plus b and a second set of weights, w2 um, dot product with x plus, plus b2. And so what this does is this is taking the max of these two, um, these two functions in a sense, right? And so what it does is it kind of generalizes the ReLU and the leaky ReLU because you're just you're taking the max over these two, um, two uh, linear functions. And so what this gives us, um, it's again, uh, you're operating in a linear regime. It doesn't saturate and it doesn't die. Uh, the problem is that here you are doubling the number of parameters per neuron, right? So each neuron now, now has this original set of, matri of weights w, but it now it has w1 and w2. So you have twice these. Um, so in practice, when we look at all of these activation functions, kind of a good general rule of thumb is use ReLU. Uh, this is the most standard one that generally just works well. Um, and uh, you, know, you, you do want to be careful in general with your learning rates to adjust them based uh, see how things do. We'll, t we'll talk more about adjusting learning rates later in this lecture. Uh, but you can also try out some of these fancier uh, activation functions, the leaky ReLU, max out, ELU. ELU. Um, but you know, these are generally, they're, they're still kind of uh, more experimental, so you can see how they work for your problem. Um, you can also try out TANH, uh, but probably some of these, these ReLU and ReLU variants are going to be better. And in general, uh, don't use sigmoid. This is this is one of the earliest original activation functions, and ReLU and these other variants um, have generally worked better since then. Okay, so now let's talk a little bit about data preprocessing, right? So the activation function we designed this as part of our network. Now we want to train the network, and we have our input data that we want to start training from. So generally, we want to always pre-process the data. And this is something that you've probably seen before in uh, machine learning classes, if you've taken those. And some standard types of pre-processing are you take your original data, and you want to zero mean them. And then you probably want to also um, normalize them, right? So uh, normalize by this uh, standard deviation. And so, so, so why do we want to do this? For zero centering, um, you can remember earlier that we talked about right when all of the inputs are positive, for example, then we get all of our gradients on the weights to be positive, and we get this uh, basically suboptimal uh, optimization. And in general, um, even if it's not you know all zero or all negative, any sort of bias will still cause this type of uh, problem. And so uh, then in terms of Normalizing the data, um, this is basically, you want to normalize data typically in machine learning problems, right, so that all features are in the same range and, and so that they contribute equally. Um, in practice, since for images, and which is what we're dealing with in, in this course here for the most part, um, we do do the zero centering, but in practice we don't actually normalize the uh, pixel value so much because generally for images, Right, at each location, you already have relatively comparable scale and distribution, and so we don't really need to normalize so much compared to uh, you know, more general machine learning problems where you might have different features uh, that are very different and, and of very different scales. And in machine learning, you might also see um, more complicated things like PCA or whitening, uh, but Again, with images, uh, we typically just stick with the zero mean, and we, we don't do the normalization. And we also don't do some of these more uh, complicated preprocessing. Um, and one reason for this is generally with images, we don't really want to take all of our input, let's say, pixel values, and project this onto a lower dimensional space of you know, new kinds of features that we're dealing with. We typically just want to apply convolutional networks spatially right, and have our spatial structure over the original image. Yeah, question. 
So, so the question is, we do this pre-processing in the training phase. Do we also uh, do the same kind of thing in the test phase? And the answer is yes. Uh, so let me just move to this next, next slide here. Right, so in general, on the training phase is where we determine our, uh, let's say, mean. And then we apply this exact same mean to the test data. Right, so we'll normalize by the same um, empirical mean from the training data. Um, OK, so, so to summarize, uh, basically in for images, right, we typically just do the zero mean preprocessing. Um, and we, we can subtract either the entire mean image. So from the training data, you compute the min, mean image, which will be the same size as, your, as each image. So for example, 32 by 32 by 3, you'll get this array of numbers. And then you subtract that from uh, each, each image that you're about to pass through the network. And you'll do the same thing at test time for this array that you determined at training time. Um, in practice, we can also, for, for some networks, um, we, we also do this by just subtracting a per channel mean. And so instead of having an entire mean image that we're uh, going to zero center by, we just take the mean by channel. And this is just because it turns out that you know it was similar enough across the whole image. It didn't make such a big difference to subtract the mean image versus just a per channel value. And this is easier to just pass around and deal with. So you'll see this as well, um, for example, in a VGG network, which is a network that came after AlexNet that we'll talk about later. Uh, question? OK, so uh, there are two questions. The first is, um, what's a channel in this case when, we're sub when we are subtracting a per channel mean? And this is uh, RGB. Right, so our array, our images are typically, for example, 32 by 32 by 3, so width, height, each of 32. And our depth, we have three channels, RGB. And so we'll have one mean for the red channel, one mean for green, one for blue. Um, and then the second, what was your second question? OK, so the question is, when we're subtracting the mean image, what is the mean taken over? And the mean is taken over all of your training images. right? So you'll take all of your training images and just compute the, the, the mean of all of those. Does that make sense? Yeah, uh, the, so the question is, uh, we do this for the entire training set once before we start training. We don't do this per batch. And yeah, that's, that's exactly correct. Um, so we just, we just want to have a good sample, right? A, an empirical mean that we have. And so if you take it per batch, if you're sampling you know, reasonable batches, it should be basically, uh, you're, you should be getting the same values anyways for the mean. And so it's, it's more uh, efficient and easier just to do this once at the beginning. You might not even have to really take it over the entire training data. You could also just sample enough training images to get a good uh, estimate of your mean. OK, so any other questions about data preprocessing? Yes. So the question is, does the data preprocessing solve the sigmoid problem? So. The data preprocessing is, is uh, doing zero mean, right? And we talked about how sigmoid, we want to have zero mean. And so it, it does uh, solve this for the first layer that we pass it through, right? So now our inputs to the first layer of our network is going to be zero mean. But we'll see later on that um, we're actually going to have this problem come up in much worse and greater form as we have deep networks. You're going to get a lot of. Uh, non-zero mean problems later on. And so in this case, um, this is not going to be sufficient. So this only helps at the first layer of your network. OK, so now let's talk about how do we want to initialize the weights of our network. Right, so we have, let's say, our, a standard uh, two-layer neural network. And we have all of these weights that we want to learn. But we have to start them with some value. Right, and, and, and then we're going to update them using our gradient updates from there. So first question, uh, what happens when we use an initialization of w equals 0? We just set all of the uh, parameters to be 0. What's the problem with this? 
So, uh, sorry, say that again. Oh, uh, I heard all the neurons are going to be dead. No updates ever. So, so, uh, not not exactly. Um, so, so part of that is correct in that all the neurons will do the same thing, right? So they might not all be dead depending on your input value. You, I mean, you you could be in any regime of your neurons, so they might not be dead. But um, the key thing is that they will all do the same thing, right? So since your weights are zero, given an input, every neuron is going to be have the uh, same operation, basically, on top of your inputs. Um, and so since they're all going to output the same thing, they're also all going to get the same gradient, right? And so because of that, they're all going to update in the same way. And now you're just going to get all neurons that are exactly the same, right? Which is not what you want. You want the neurons to learn different things. And so that's, that's the problem when you initialize everything uh, equally. And there's basically no symmetry breaking here. So what's the first, yeah, question? So the question is, because that because the gradient also depends on our loss, won't one uh, backprop differently compared to the other? So, um, so in the last layer, like yes, you you do have uh, basically some of this. The gradients will get the same. Um, sorry, we'll get different loss right for each specific neuron based on which class it was connected to. But if you look at all the neurons generally throughout your network, like you're going to, uh, you basically have a lot of these neurons that are connected in exactly the same way, they have the same updates, and it's basically um, going to be a problem. Okay, so the first idea that we can have to try and uh, improve upon this is to set all of the weights to be small random numbers that we can sample from a distribution. So in this case, we're going to sample from uh, a basically a standard Gaussian, but we're going to scale it Right, so that the standard deviation is actually um, 1 e negative 2, 0 0.01. And so this gives us many small random weights. And so this does work OK for small networks. Right Now, now we've broken the symmetry. Uh, but there's going to be problems with deeper networks. And so let's take a look at why this is the case. So here, uh, this is basically an experiment that we can do, where let's take a deeper network. So in this case, Let's initialize a, a 10 layer neural network to have 500 neurons in each of these 10 layers. Okay, we'll use uh, tan H nonlinearities in this case, and we'll initialize it with uh, small random numbers as we described in the last slide. So here we're going to basically just initialize this network. Um, we have random data that we're going to take, and now let's just pass it through the entire network, and at each layer, look at the statistics of the activations that come out of that, uh, that layer. And so what we'll see, this is probably a little bit hard to read up top, but um, if we compute the mean and the standard deviations uh, at each layer, we'll see that at the first, uh, first layer, this is a, uh, it, the means are always around zero. There's a funny sound in here. Um, interesting. Okay, well, that was fixed. <laughs> um, so if we look at we, if we look at the outputs from here, right, the mean is always going to be around zero, um, which makes sense, right? So if we look here, um, let's see. If we take this, we looked at the uh, dot product of x with w, and then we took the non tan h nonlinearity, and then we stored these values, and so. Because the tan h is uh, centered around zero, this will make sense. Um, and then the standard deviation, however, shrinks and it quickly collapses to zero, right? And so if we're plotting this um, here, this second row of plots here is showing the uh, the mean and the standard deviations over time per layer. And then in the bottom, the sequence of plots is showing for each of our layers what's the distribution of the activations that we have. And so we can see that at the first layer, we still have a, we have a reasonable Gaussian-looking thing. It's a nice distribution. But the problem is that as we multiply by this w, these small numbers, at each layer, this quickly shrinks and collapses all of these values, right, as we multiply this 
over and over again. And so by the end, we get all of these zeros, um, right, which is, which is not what we want. Right? So we get all the activations become zero. And so now let's think about the backward pass. So if we do a backward pass now, assuming this was our forward pass, and now we want to compute our gradients. So first, uh, what does the gradients look like on the weights? Does anyone have a guess? So, okay, so if we think about this, um, we have our input values are very small at each layer, right? Uh, because they've all collapsed to this near zero. And then now at each layer, we have our upstream gradient flowing down. And then in order to get the uh, gradient on the weights, remember it's the, our upstream gradient times our local gradient, which for this, this dot product, we're doing w times x, is just basically going to be x, which is our inputs, right? So it's again, the similar kind of problem that we saw earlier, where now since, so here because x is small, our weights are getting a very small gradient and they're basically not updating. All right, so this is a way that you can uh, basically try and think about the effect of gradient flows through your networks, right? You can always think about what the, what the forward pass is doing and then think about what's happening as you have gradient flows coming down and different types of inputs, what the effect of this actually is on our, on our weights and the gradients on them. Um, and so also, if now if we think about, right, what's the, uh, what's the, the gradient that's going to be flowing back from each layer as we're chaining all these gradients, right? So this is going to be the flip thing where we have now the gradient flowing back is our upstream gradient times, in this case, the local gradient is W, right, on our input X. Um, and so, again, because this is the dot product. And so now actually going backwards at each layer, we're basically doing a multiplication of the upstream gradient by our weights in order to uh, get the next gradient flowing downwards. And so because here we're multiplying by W over and over again, you're getting basically the same phenomenon as we had in the forward pass where everything is getting smaller and smaller and now all the gradient, uh, upstream gradients are collapsing to zero as well. Yeah, question. Yeah, so I guess, um, Upstream and downstream is, can be interpreted differently depending on if you're going forward and, and backwards. But in this case, we're going, we're, doing, uh, we're going backwards, right? We're doing back propagation. And so upstream is the gradient flowing. You can think of a flow from your loss all the way back to your inputs. And so upstream is what came from what you've already done flowing you know, down into your, into your current node. Right, so we're, f we're flowing downwards, and what we get coming into the node through backprop is coming from upstream. Uh, okay, so now let's think about what happens when, you know, we, we saw that this was a problem when our weights were pretty small, right? So we can think about, well, what if we just try and solve this by making our weights big? So let's, let's sample from this standard Gaussian, now with standard deviation uh, one instead of 0 0.01. So what's the, what's the problem here? Does anyone have a guess? If our weights are now all big, right, and we're passing them, uh, and we're taking these outputs of W times X and passing them through tan H nonlinearities, remember we were talking about what happens uh, at different values of inputs to tan H, so what's the problem? Okay, so yeah, so I heard that it's going to be saturated. So that's right. Uh, basically now, right, because our weights are going to be big, we're going to always be at saturated regimes of either very negative or very positive of the tan H. And so in practice, what you're going to get here is um, now, right, if we look at the distribution of the activations at each of the layers here on the bottom, they're going to be all basically uh, negative one or plus one, right? And so this will have the problem that we talked about with the tan H earlier when they're saturated, that all the gradients will be zero and our weights are not updating. So basically it's really hard to get your, uh, your weight initialization right, right? When it's too small, they all collapse. When it's too large, they saturate. So there's been some work in trying to figure out, well, what's the proper way to initialize these weights?
And so one kind of good rule of thumb that you can uh, use is the Xavier initialization. Um, and so this is from this paper uh, by Glorat in, in 2010. And so what this, this uh, formula is, is if we look at W up here, right, we can see that we want to initialize them to these, uh, you know, we sample from our standard Gaussian, and then we're going to scale by the number of inputs that we have. And you can go through the math, I think it's in the lecture notes as well as in this paper, of exactly how this works out. But basically, the way we do it is we specify that we want the variance of the input to be the same as the variance of the output. And then if you derive what the weights should be, you'll get this formula. Um, and intuitively, what this kind of means is that if you have a small number of inputs, right, then we're going to divide by the smaller number and get larger weights. And we need larger weights uh, because with small inputs and you're multiplying each of these by a weight, you need larger weights to get the same uh, larger variance at output and kind of vice versa for if we have many inputs, then we want smaller weights in order to get the uh, same spread at the output. So you can look at the, the notes for more details about this. Um, and so basically now if we want to have a unit Gaussian, right, as input to each layer, we can use this kind of initialization to, uh, at training time, be able to initialize this so that there is approximately a unit Gaussian at each layer. Um, okay, and so one thing this does assume, though, is that it assumes that there's linear activations, and so it assumes that we are in the activation, uh, in the active region of, the, of a tan H, for example. Um, and so again, you can uh, look at the notes to, to really try and understand this derivation. Uh, but the problem is that this breaks when you, now you use something like a ReLU, right? And so with the ReLU, uh, what happens is that because it's killing half of your units, Right, it's, it's setting approximately half of them to zero at each time. It's actually having the variance that you get out of this. And so now if you just um, make the same assumptions as your derivation earlier, you won't actually uh, get, the, get the right variance coming out. Um, it's going to be too small. And so what you see is, again, this kind of phenomenon as, as it, the distribution starts collapsing. In this case, you get more and more peak towards zero and more units deactivated. And the way to address this uh, was something um, that has been pointed out in uh, some papers, which is that you can, you can try and account for this with an extra uh, divided by two, right? So now um, you're basically adjusting for the fact that half the, uh, half the neurons get killed. And so um, your, your kind of equivalent input has actually half these number of inputs. And so if you just add this divide by two factor in, uh, this works much better and you can see that the, the distributions are pretty good throughout all layers of the, of the network. And so in practice, uh, this has been really important actually for training. These types of little things to uh, really pay attention to how your weights are uh, make a big difference. And so, for example, um, you'll see in uh, some papers that um, this actually is the difference between the network you know, even training at all and, and performing well versus uh, nothing happening. So uh, proper initialization is still an active area of research, and so if you're interested in this, you can look at a lot of these uh, papers and resources. Um, a good general rule of thumb is basically use the Xavier initialization to start with, and then you can also um, think about uh, some of these other kinds of methods. And so now we're going to talk about a related idea to this, to this idea of wanting to keep activations in a Gaussian range that we want. Right, and so this idea behind what we're going to call batch normalization is, okay, we want unit Gaussian activations. Let's just make them that way. Let's just force them to be that way. And so how does this work? So let's consider a batch of activations at some layer. Right, so now we have all of our, all of our activations coming out. If we want to make this uh, unit Gaussian, we actually can just do this empirically, right? We can take the mean um, of the batch that we have so far, of, of the current batch, and we can just, and the, variation, and the variance, and we can just normalize by this, right? And so basically, um, instead of with weight initialization, we're setting this at the start of training so that we try and get it into a good spot that we can have you know, unit Gaussians at every layer, and hopefully during training, this will preserve this. Now we're going to explicitly make that happen 
on every forward pass through the network, right? We're going to make this happen functionally and uh, basically by normalizing by the mean and the variance of uh, each neuron, we look at all of the, all of the uh, inputs coming into it and calculate the mean and the variance for that batch and normalize it by it. And the thing is that this is, a, this is just a differentiable function, right? If we have our mean and our variance as constants, this is just a sequence of um, computational operations that we can differentiate and do backprop through this. Um, okay, so yeah, so just as I was saying earlier, right, if we look at our input data and we think of this as we have n training examples in our current batch, and then each batch has a dimension d, we're going to compute the empirical mean and variance independently for each dimension, right? So each basically feature element. And we compute this across uh, our batch, our current mini batch that we have, and we normalize by this. And so this is usually inserted after fully connected or convolutional layers, right? We saw that when we were multiplying by W in these layers, which we do over and over again, then we can have this uh, bad scaling effect with each one. And so this basically is able to um, undo this effect, right? And since we're, we're basically just scaling uh, by the inputs connected to each neuron, each activation, um, we can apply this the same way to fully connected and convolutional uh, layers. And the only difference is that um, with convolutional layers, we want to normalize not just, uh, not just across all the training examples, um, and independently for each, each feature dimension, but we actually want to normalize jointly across both um, all, the, all, the, all the feature dimensions, all the spatial locations that we have in our activation map, as well as all of the uh, training examples. Um, and we do this because we want to obey the convolutional property and we want nearby locations to be normalized the same way, right? And so with a convolutional layer, we're basically going to have a, uh, one mean and one standard deviation per activation map that we have, and we're going to normalize by this across all of the examples in the batch. Um, and so this is something that uh, you guys are going to implement in your next homework. And so um, all of these details are explained very clearly in this paper um, from 2015. And so uh, this is a very useful, useful uh, technique that you want to use a lot in practice. You want to have these batch normalization layers. And so, um, you should uh, read this paper, go through all of the uh, derivations, and then um, also go through the derivations of how to compute the gradients uh, with given these uh, this normalization operation. Okay, so one thing that I just want to point out is that it's not clear that you know we're we're doing this batch normalization right after every fully connected layer. And it's not clear that we necessarily want a unit Gaussian input to these tanh nonlinearities, because what this is doing is this is constraining you to the linear regime of this nonlinearity. And we're not actually, you're trying to basically say, let's not have any of this saturation, but maybe a little bit of this is good, right? You, you want to be able to control what's, uh, how much saturation that you want to have. And so what, the way that we address this when we're doing batch normalization is that we have our normalization operation. But then after that, we have this additional squashing and scaling operation. So we do our normalization, then we're going to scale by some uh, constant gamma, and then shift by another factor of beta. right? And so what this actually does is that this allows you to be able to recover uh, the identity function if you wanted to. So if the network wanted to, it could learn your scaling factor gamma to be just your variance. It could learn your beta to be your uh, mean. And in this case, you can, you can recover the identity mapping. It's as if you didn't have batch normalization. And so now you have the flexibility of doing um, kind of everything in between and making your, the network learning uh, how to make your TANH more or less saturated and how much to do so in order um, to, to have uh, you know, to have good training. Okay, so just to sort of summarize the batch normalization idea, right, so given our inputs, we're going to uh, compute our mini batch mean. So we do this for every mini batch that's coming in. 
we compute our variance, we normalize by this median variance, and we have this additional scaling and shifting factor. And so this um, improves gradient flow through the network. Um, it's also more robust as a result. It, it uh, works for more range of learning rates and, and different kinds of initialization. So people have seen that once you put batch normalization in, it's just easier to train, and so that's why you should do this. Um, and then um, also one, one thing that I just want to point out is that you can also think of this as in a way also doing some regularization, right? And so because now the, at the output of each layer, um, each of these, these activations, uh, each of these outputs is an output of both your input X as well as the other examples in the batch that it happens to be sampled with, right? Because you're going to normalize each input data by the empirical mean over that batch. So because of that, it's no longer producing deterministic values for a given training example, and it's tying all of these uh, inputs in a batch together. And so this basically, because it's no longer deterministic, kind of jitters your representation of x a little bit and in a sense gives some sort of regularization effect. Yeah, question. Question is, gamma and beta are learned parameters, and yes. Yeah, the, so the question is, why do we want to learn this gamma and beta to be able to uh, learn the identity, identity function back? And the reason is because you want to give it the flexibility, right? So um, what batch normalization is doing is it's forcing our uh, data to become this unit Gaussian, our inputs to be this unit Gaussian. But even though in general this is a good idea, it's, it's not always that this is exactly the best thing to do. Right, and we saw in particular for something like a tan H, you might want to control some degree of saturation that you have. And so what this does is it gives you the flexibility of, of doing this exact like unit Gaussian normalization if it wants to, but also learning that maybe in this particular part of the network, maybe it's, it's not the best thing to do. Maybe we want something still in this general idea, but slightly different, right? Slightly scaled or shifted. And so these parameters just give it that extra flexibility to learn that if it wants to. Um, and then if it, yeah, if the best thing to do is, is just uh, batch normalization, then it'll learn the right parameters for that. Yes. Um, yeah, so basically each neuron uh, output, right? So we have uh, output of a fully connected layer, we have W times X, and so we have the values of each of these these outputs, and then we're going to apply batch normalization separately to each of these neurons. Question. Yeah, so the question is that uh, for things like reinforcement learning, you might have a really small batch size. How do you, do it, how do you deal with this? Um, so, in, in practice, I guess batch normalization has been used a lot for like for standard convolutional neural networks, and there's uh, there's actually papers on how do we want to do normalization for uh, different kinds of recurrent networks, or you know some of these networks that might also be in uh, reinforcement learning. And so there's different considerations that you might want to think of there, and um, this is still an active area of research. There's uh, papers on this, and we might also talk about some of this more later. Um, but for a typical convolutional neural network, this generally works fine. And then if you have a smaller batch size, um, maybe this becomes a little bit less accurate, uh, but you still get kind of the same effect. And you know, it's possible also that you could design your um, mean and variance to be computed maybe over more examples, right? And, and I think in practice, usually it's just okay, so you don't see this too much, but, it, but this is something that maybe could help if that was a problem. Yeah, question. So the question is, if we force the inputs to be Gaussian, do we lose the structure, right? So, um, so no, in a sense that you can think of, like, if you had all your features distributed as a Gaussian, for example, if, even if you were just doing data preprocessing, this Gaussian is not losing you any structure, right? All the, it's just 
shifting and scaling your data into a regime that is that works well for the operations that you're going to perform on it. Um, in convolutional layers, you do have some structure that you want to preserve spatially, right? You want, like, if you look at your activation maps, you want them to relatively all make sense to each other. So in this case, you do want to uh, take that into consideration. And so now we're going to normalize, find one mean for the entire activation map. So we only find the empirical mean invariance over training examples. Um, and yeah, and so that, that's something that um, you'll be doing in your homework, and also it's explained in the, in the paper as well, so you should refer to that. Yes? So the question is, uh, are we normalizing the weights so that they become Gaussian? So if I understand your question correctly, um, then the answer is, uh, we're normalizing the inputs to each layer. So we're not, we're, not, we're not changing the weights in this process. Yeah, so, so the question is, once we subtract by the mean and divide by the standard deviation, does this become uh, Gaussian? And the answer is, is yes. So if you think about the operations that are happening, um, uh, basically you're shifting by the mean, right? And so this shifts it to be zero centered, and then you're scaling by the standard deviation. Um, this now transforms this uh, into a unit Gaussian. And so um, if, you, if you want to uh, look more into that, I think you can look at, there's a lot of, um, machine learning explanations that go into exactly, you know, what this, visualizing what this operation is doing. But yeah, this basically takes your data and turns it into a, a Gaussian distribution. Okay, so yeah, a uh, question. So the question is, if we're going to be doing this shift in scale and learning these, is the batch normalization redundant because you could recover the identity mapping? So in the case that, it, that the network learns that identity mapping is always the best and it learns these parameters, then yeah, there would be kind of no point for batch normalization. But in practice, this doesn't happen. So in practice, we will learn this gamma and beta that's not the same as the identity mapping. So it will shift and scale by some amount, but not the amount that's going to give you an identity mapping. And so what you get is you still get this uh, batch normalization effect, right? So having this identity mapping there, um, I'm only putting this here to say that in the extreme, it could learn the identity mapping, but in practice, it doesn't. Oh, oh, right, right. Yeah, yeah, sorry. So, okay, so I was, I was not clear about this. But yeah, I think this is related to the other question earlier. Um, that, yeah, so when we're doing this, we're actually getting zero mean and unit Gaussian, which puts this into a nice shape, but it doesn't uh, have to actually be a Gaussian. Um, so, yeah, I mean, ideally, if we're looking at, like, inputs coming in as, you know, um, sort of approximately Gaussian, we would like it to have this kind of effect, but yeah, in practice it doesn't um, have to be. Thanks. Um, okay, so, okay, so the last thing I just want to mention about this is that, uh, so at test time, um, the batch normalization layer, we now take the uh, empirical mean and, um, and uh, vari variance from the training data. So we don't recompute this as test time. We just estimate this at training time, for example, using running averages. And then, um, and then we're going to use this as at test time. So we're just going to scale by that. Okay, so now I'm going to move on to uh, babysitting the learning process, right? So now we've defined our network architecture and we'll talk about how do we monitor training 
um, and and uh, how do we adjust hyperparameters as we go to get um, good learning results. So as always, the, so the first step we want to do is we want to pre-process the data, right? So we, we want to zero mean the data as we talked about earlier. Then we want to choose the architecture. And so here we um, are starting with uh, one hidden layer of uh, 50 neurons, for example. Um, but we basically, we can pick any architecture that we want to start with. And then the first thing that we want to do is we initialize our network. We do a forward pass through it, right? And we want to make sure that our loss is reasonable. So we talked about this several uh, lectures ago where um, we have a basically a, let's say we have a softmax classifier that we have here. We know what our loss should be when our weights are small and we have generally a diffuse distribution. Um, then we want it to be the softmax classifier loss is going to be your negative log likelihood, which if we have 10 classes, it'll be something like negative log of 1 over 10, which here is uh, around 2.3. And so we want to make sure that our loss is, is what we expect it to be. Right? So this is a, a good sanity check that we want um, to always, always do. So now once we've seen that our original loss is good, now we want to, um, uh, so, so first we want to do this having zero regularization, right? So we, when we disable the regularization, now our only loss term is this data loss, which is going to give 2.3 here. And so here, uh, now we want to crank up the regularization. And uh, when we do that, we want to see that our loss goes up, right? Because we've added this additional regularization term. So this is a good next step that you can do for your sanity check. Um, and then, now we can start training. So, so now if we start trying to train, um, what we do is, a good way to do this is to start off with a very small amount of data, right? Because if you have just a very small training set, you should be able to overfit this very well and get very good training loss on here. Um, and so in this case, uh, we want to turn off our regularization again and just see if we can make the loss go down to zero. And so we can see how our loss is changing as we uh, have all of these epochs. We compute our loss at each uh, epoch, and we want to see this go all the way down to zero. Right? And here we can see that also our training accuracy is going all the way up to one, and this makes sense. Right? If you have a very small number of data, you should be able to um, overfit this perfectly. OK, so now once you've done that, these are all sanity checks. Now you can start really trying to train. So now you can take your full training data, and now start with a small amount of regularization, right? And let's first figure out what's a good learning rate. So learning rate is one of the most important hyperparameters, and it's something that you, that you want to adjust first. So, so you want to try some value of learning rate. And here I've tried 1 e negative 6, and you can see that the loss is barely changing. Right? And so the reason this is barely changing is usually because your learning rate is too small. Right, so when it's too small, your gradient updates are not big enough, and your cost is uh, basically about the same. Um, OK, so one thing that uh, I want to point out here is that we can notice that even though our loss was barely changing, the training and the validation accuracy jumped up to 20% very quickly. And so does anyone have any idea for why this might be the case? Why, so remember we have a softmax function and our loss didn't really change, but our, but our uh, accuracy improved a lot. Okay, so the reason for this is that uh, here the probabilities are still pretty diffuse, right? So our loss term is still pretty similar, but um, when we shift all of these probabilities slightly in the right direction, because we're learning, right? Our weights are changing in the right direction. Now, um, the accuracy all of a sudden can jump because we're taking the maximum correct value, and so um, we're going to get a big jump in accuracy even though our loss is still relatively diffuse. Okay, so now if we try another learning rate, now here I'm jumping in the other extreme, picking a very big learning rate, 1e negative 6. What's happening is that our cost is now giving us NANs. And when you have NANs, what this usually means is that uh, basically, your cost exploded, and so the the reason for that is typically that your learning rate was too high, 
so then you can adjust your learning rate down again. Here I can see that for, you know, trying three e to the negative three, the cost is still exploding. So usually this, the rough range for learning rates that we want to look at is between one e negative three and one e negative five. And this is the rough range that we want to be uh, cross-validating in between. So you want to try out values in this range, and depending on whether your loss is too slow or too small or whether it's too large, uh, adjust it based on this. And so how do we exactly pick these hyperparameters, right? Uh, do hyperparameter op optimization and pick the best values of all of these hyperparameters. So the strategy that we're going to use is for any hyperparameter, for example, learning rate, to do cross-validation. Right? So cross-validation is training on your training set and then uh, evaluating on a validation set. How well did this hyperparameter do? Something that you guys have already done in your assignment. And so typically we want to do this in stages. And so we can do first a course stage where we pick values pretty spread out apart. And then we learn for only a few epochs. And with only a few epochs, you can already get a pretty good sense of which hyperparameters are, uh, which values are good or not, right? You can quickly see that it's a NAN, or you can see that nothing is happening, and you can adjust accordingly. So typically, once you do that, then you can see what's sort of a, a pretty good range and the range that you want to now do finer uh, sampling of values in. And so this is the second stage where now you might want to uh, run this for a longer time and do a finer search over that region. Uh, and one, one tip for um, detecting explosions like NANDs, you can have in your training loop, right, sample some hyperparameter, um, start training, and then look at your cost uh, at, at every iteration or every epoch. And if you ever get a cost that's that's much larger than your original cost, so for example, something like three times your original cost, then you know that this is not heading in the right direction, right? It's getting very big very quickly, and you can just break out of your loop, stop this, this hyperparameter choice, and pick something else. All right, so an example of this, uh, let's say uh, here we're, we want to run now course search for five epochs, right? This is a similar you know, uh, network that we were talking about earlier, and what we can do is we can see uh, all of these validation accuracies that we're getting. And I've put in, uh, highlighted in red the ones that give better values. And so these are going to be regions that we're going to look into in more detail. And one thing to note is that it's usually better to optimize in a uh, log space. And so here, instead of sampling, let's say, uniformly between you know, 1e to the negative 0 0.01 and 100, you're going to actually uh, do 10 to the power of some range. Right, and this is because um, the learning rate is multiplying your gradient update, and so it has these, uh, these multiplicative effects. And so um, it's, it makes more sense to consider a range of learning rates that are multiplied or divided by some value rather than uniformly sampled. Um, so you want to be dealing with orders of magnitude here. OK, so once you find that, um, you can then adjust your range. Right, get In this case, um, we have a range of you know, maybe uh, 10 to the negative 4, right, to 10 to the, to the zeroth power. These are, this is a good range that we want to narrow down into. Um, and so we can do this again. And here we can see that we're getting a relatively good accuracy of 53%. And so this means we're headed in the right direction. But one thing that I want to point out is that here we actually have a problem. And so the problem is that we can see that our best accuracy here has a uh, learning rate that's that's about uh, you know it's all, all of our good learning rates are in this e to the negative four range, right? And since the learning rate that we specified was going from uh, ten to the negative four to ten to the zero, that means that all the good learning rates were at the edge of the uh, range that we were sampling, and so this is uh, this is bad because. Um, this means that we might not have explored our space sufficiently, right? We might actually want to go to 10 to the negative 5 or 10 to the negative 6. There might be still better ranges if we continue shifting down. So you want to make sure that your range kind of has the good values somewhere in the middle or somewhere where you get a sense that you've hit, you've explored your range fully. Okay, and so another thing um, is that we can sample all of our different hyperparameters using a kind of grid search, right? We can sample 
for a, a fixed set of combinations, uh, a fixed set of values for each hyperparameter, sample uh, in a grid manner over all of these values. But in practice, it's actually better to sample from a random layout, so sampling a random value of each hyperparameter in a range. And so what you'll get instead is if we have these two hyperparameters here that we want to sample from, you'll get samples that look like this right side in instead. And the reason for this is that if a function is really sort of more, more a function of one variable than in another, uh, which is usually true, usually we have a little bit more, a lower effective dimensionality than we actually have, then you're going to get many more samples of the important variable that you have. Right? You're going to be able to see this shape um, in this green function that I've drawn on top, showing where the good values are, um, compared to if you just did a, gri a grid layout where you know, we were only able to sample three values here and you missed where were the good regions. Right? And so basically we'll get much more useful signal overall since we have more samples of different values of the important variable. Um, and so hyperparameters to play with, right, we've talked about learning rate, uh, things like different types of uh, decay schedules, update types, regularization, um, also your network architecture, so the number of hidden units, the depth, all of these are hyperparameters that you can optimize over. And we've talked about some of these, but we'll keep talking about more of these in the next lecture. And so you can think of this as kind of, you know, if you're basically tuning all the knobs, right, of some, uh, of some uh, turntable where you're, you're a neural networks practitioner, you can think of the music that's output is the last function that you want, and you want to adjust everything appropriately to get the kind of output that you want. Right, so it's really kind of an art that you're, that you're doing. And in practice, you're going to uh, do a lot of hyperparameter optimization, a lot of cross-validation. And so, you know, in order to get numbers, people will run cross-validation over tons of hyperparameters, monitor all of them, see which ones are doing better, which ones are doing worse. Here we have all of these loss curves. Uh, pick the right ones, readjust, and keep going through this process. Um, and so, as I mentioned earlier, right, as you're monitoring each of these loss curves, learning rate is an important one, but you, you'll get a sense for how different learning rates, which learning rates are good and bad. So you'll see that if you have a very high exploding one, right, this is, a, your loss explodes, then your learning rate is too high. If it's too kind of linear and too flat, you'll see that it's too low. Uh, it's, it's not changing enough. And if you get uh, something that looks like there's a steep change but then a plateau, this is also an indicator of it being maybe too high because in this case um, you, you're taking too large jumps and you're not able to settle well into your uh, local optimum. And so a good learning rate usually ends up looking something like this where you have a relatively steep curve but then it's continuing to go down and then you might keep adjusting your learning rate from there. And so this is something that you're, you'll see um, through practice. Okay, and just, uh, I think we're very close to the end, so just one last thing that I uh, want to point out is that um, in case you ever see learning rate uh, loss curves where it's, it's f sorry, if you ever see loss curves where it's flat for a while and then starts trading all of a sudden, um, a potential reason could be bad initialization. So in this case, your gradients are not really flowing too well at the beginning, uh, so nothing's really learning, and then at some point it just happens to adjust in the right way such that it, tips over and, and things just start training, right? And so um, there's a lot of uh, experience at looking at these and seeing what's wrong that you'll get over time. Um, and so you'll, you'll usually want to monitor your, and visualize your accuracy, right? Your, uh, if you have a big gap between your training uh, accuracy and your validation accuracy, it usually means that you might have overfitting and you might want to increase your regularization strength. If you have no gap, you might uh, want to increase your model capacity because you, you haven't overfit yet. You could potentially increase it more. And in general, we also want to track the updates, the ratio of our, of our weight updates to our weight magnitudes. Right? So we can just take the norm of our, um, of our parameters that we have to get a sense for how, lar how large they are. And when we have our update size, we can also take the norm of that, get a sense for how large that, that is. And we want this ratio to be somewhere around 0.001 there's, there's a lot of uh, variance in this range, so you don't have to be exactly on this, but it's just a sense of you don't want your updates to be 
too large compared to your value or too small, right? You don't want it to dominate or to have no effect. And so this is just something that can help debug what might be a problem. Okay, so in summary, uh, today we've looked at activation functions, data preprocessing, weight initialization, batch norm, babysitting the learning process, and hyperparameter optimization. Um, these are kind of the takeaways for each that you guys should keep in mind. Use ReLUs, subtract the mean, use Xavier initialization, use batch norm, and sample hyperparameters randomly. And next time we'll, talk, we'll continue to talk about uh, training neural networks uh, with all of these different topics.